Hi, David Vizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. This presentation of Paratech 10 is part two of the 383 build that I uh, started uh, oh, about a month ago. That would have been in April. Anyway, I'm going to uh, deal with this situation by starting off doing something I haven't done before, and that is take a post on a large forum and have a look and see what kind of advice the guy gets and point out the mistakes on it. This falls right in line with what I'm doing here is trying to get my or our uh, um, viewers to be able to understand and have an appreciation for the spec of things. Now, the focal point of this you, you'll see as, as we move in. So let's take a look at the uh, specification that this forum presented. Here's the website in question. Hot Rodder. Looks a pretty slick site, but let's see what we've got in the way of advice for our 383 engine builder. This is your uh, typical uh, enthusiast guy, and he's asking for opinions on this build, and that's just what I'm going to give him. Opinions based on years of successful race engine building. The block's a good choice, although pretty much any block would have done at this power level. So we'll check that as okay. Next on the list is a scat cast steel crank with a 3.75 stroke. So as we get the 383 cubes. This comes under my heading as a best buy. The SCAT Pro Series rods are great value for money. However, Acrim has chosen a 5.7 inch long rod. My dyno testing has shown that the 6 inch rod is slightly superior on power and it also cuts piston slap which means a quieter running engine. The dyno tests I did for a uh, seal power definitely showed that the D-shaped dish pistons work well. So score 9 out of 10 on that. Having the pistons 5 in the hole is not the best plan. Uh, it would be much better to have them 5 out. Uh, ideally you need the quench to be about 28 to 30 thousandths total clearance. That clearance, of course, does assume we are going to use that 40 thousandths thick head gasket. As for the enforcer heads from AFR, these are ideal if you're having to buy within a budget. So far, this engine spec is looking kind of okay. But here is where we come to a major snafu. As far as the profiles go, this cam looks okay. However, the lift is a bit shy of what's needed. The 1.6 or 1.65 rockers would fix that. Where this cam fails abysmally is on the lobe centerline angle chosen. And if that was the cam chosen by Howards, then shame on the guy that picked it. It is so far off what's needed, it's unbelievable. Should be 107. The power that this engine is giving away means that this 383 might make what a, a decent 350 does in terms of torque. As far as rockers are concerned, they need to be ideally 165 on the intake and 16 on the exhaust. As for the exhaust, we're on a crossover point. 1 and 5.8 diameter headers are good to about 525, 550 horsepower on a small block Chevy. This engine should make 
around about 540, 550 horsepower. So there's this situation where inch and three quarter headers might just come into play. As for the dynamic compression, that's fine for what you currently have. Eight to one is a good number to go for with a street motor on pump gas. However, the cam I'm suggesting here will marginally raise that, but you should still be okay. As for the intake, an Edelbrock air gap performer RPM manifold will work fine, so long as there's adequate carburation and a stepped dogleg style booster is used. This atomizes the fuel much better than the straight leg booster, which is inadequate for the job on a non-heated intake. For good results, carburation can be quite finicky. Don't use a 650, it's too small. The 750 might be just about the bottom limit of what you should use, but a double pumper is not the way to go. A good vacuum secondary carb is going to be it. Both Holly and Quick Fuel have very good vacuum secondary carburetors. For a two plane without an intake spacer, you're going to be looking at 800 to 850 to give the best area under the curve. The first thing I need to uh, let you know is that uh, this was essentially a dyno mule and it went through several uh, different iterations during uh, uh, the three years or so that it was just used on the dyno. This means you will see it in several di different guises. Now for some block details. First, all the machining was done at Terry Walters Engines in Roanoke. And uh, very nice job they make. I mean, Terry's an ex-pro stock guy. He does pro stock work on pretty much everything. Not necessarily the cheapest in the world, but definitely very good quality for what you pay. Now, a warning on blocks. Don't use the later roller cam blocks. It is possible to very easily overpower them. I've used three of these blocks, that's the 880 block, and I've broken every one. One of them at only about 520 horsepower. Well, 520 horsepower is kid stuff, right? So don't use one of those blocks over about 500 horsepower. Get the earlier block and a four bolt block's best, but you can put on splay caps and that's your best option. What you're looking at here is what could possibly be described as the heart of our 383, our beastly 383. This is the basic SCAT 9000 crank and I can tell you from experience that we found it to be okay on a non-detonating properly set up motor up to 660 horsepower. We've never broken one and at the time of doing this video uh, I believe there's three versions but the COVID-19 slow up may have uh, changed that. This one's the basic one here. The crank we normally use is shown in this video here with the rounded edges. It's a few bucks more but I'm the one that did the original proof of concept test for SCAT on this that rounded crank is worth about seven to nine horsepower over the flat face crank that you've, I've just shown you. As for rods, we rarely use anything other than these scat stroker rods. They're very cost effective. They will go to 8,000 RPM and 700 horsepower with absolutely no problem. There are some good piston choices available. I'm showing this uh, DSS piston here because it has a novel feature. Note the X in the uh, thrust face of the piston. That's there to do two things. First, it moderates the oil on the bore. If there's too much, it takes it away. If there's not enough, it puts it there. Secondly, it enhances the break-in procedure by making sure that any fine grit or iron particles from the break-in 
get passed down those grooves instead of getting trapped between the skirt and the bore and scoring the bore. It's very effective at that. The last point to note here is the dish in the piston. We've tested pistons from Mali, Seal Power, Icon, and a few others, uh, and that dish piston setup always seems to work very well in a motor between 9 and 10 to 1 compression. When it comes to piston rings, I very much favor Total Seal. And uh, this is what I use unless I'm using a Mali piston, which of course comes with a pretty good ring pack. Here's one of our high compression short blocks. Just so you're sure, here's where the piston should be at TDC. Bearings, well we use mostly cleavite. The key to success here is getting the clearances right as it's shown in the text in the picture. If you don't have fancy equipment check out the uh, title shown on screen. Do it right and it should all spin something like this. If it doesn't refer to episode 12 parts 1, 2 and 3. When it comes to piston installation, don't use one of those sheet metal ring compressors. Use a full circle deal like this Total Seal one here. It will save you broken rings, especially if you're using skinny rings. We are now entering the blunder zone, namely cam selection. Because of time constraints, I'm going to have to be a little more focused on what we did with our street and race 383s here. Let's talk lobe center line angles, as this is the most important factor to get right. For engines with intake valves 202 to about 208, and compressions from about 9.5 to 10.5, you are going to want about 106 for a roller cam and 107 for a flat tappet cam. If you're going up to 12 and a half to 1 like we did for our race engine that we showed in part 1, then with a 12 and a half to 1 compression those uh, lobe center line angles will go to 108 for a roller cam 109 for a flat topic cam. As far as cam advance goes, this depends on the size of the intake valve used. For a regular 202 valve, the ubiquitous 4 degrees works pretty well across the board. For a bigger valve, say a 208, that timing may need to drop back to about 2.5 to 3 degrees of advance. We've had some good experience with roller hydraulics in our 12 and a half to 1 383. This comp cams grind done for us here, to my specs, cranked out 621 horsepower on the dyno. The lobe center line was 108 and the duration was about 300 at 6 thousandths on the intake and about 304 on the exhaust. A word about lifters. With this advice, you'll avoid the possibility of losing up to 100 horsepower on lifter selection. Use only a limited travel lifter. Yes, they're more money, but they're essential for what we're doing here. For anything less than an all-out build, I use these uh, adjustable timing chain setups from Comp. Uh, They've got about plus or minus six degrees of advance and retard. They're easy to adjust and uh, it allows us to get the timing absolutely spot on when we're on the dyno and dialing everything in. When it's virtually a cost no object build, we usually go with an ATI damper or a BHJ, but cost is a factor here and we've had very good results with these professional products uh, dampers as shown here. 
Also note the split timing cover so that we can get at our cam whilst it's on the dyno without having to strip down the entire front of the engine. Before we button up the bottom end, it's time to look at the lube system. At this point, most builders glibly install a high pressure, high volume pump. In most cases, I refrain from doing this. Usually, some porting work on the pump entry and exit points gets the job done. After this, I normally get about 5 to 10 psi more without draining the engine any extra power to drive the pump. The pan I'm showing here is an entry level Moroso item. Well, that's the bottom end uh, about uh, catered for. Now, if you want to do a check on to see how well you've built it, this whole issue here the, with the cam installed, but no heads or anything like this, and the pump and everything should not take more than about 20 foot pounds to turn it over. Normally when I'm doing this, the turning torque is around about 16 uh, pounds feet. So you've got a goal to shoot for there. Now it's time to move on to the cylinder heads and induction system. First, the heads. These were some dark heads that I ported myself. They were the Platinum Pros. They started off at about 180 cc's and by the time I'd finished porting them they were about 195. You might want to check out some of my porting videos and you'll get the uh, idea. The porting in this shop is not the same as your everyday porting you see on videos normally. But I'll leave you to check that out. Here is the chamber of the Dart Platinum Pro 1 head that Tony at Dart did so much wet flow testing on to optimize as far as possible how the mixture entered the cylinders. He did a great job because in spite of flowing no more air than before, this cylinder head produced some excellent results on the dyno. I did some testing for the late Dick Maskin, who was the boss at Dart, uh, with them. Um, uh, both types of cylinder heads, the previous one and the wet flow one, with a 274 Jones hydraulic roller cam. The results were as you see here. Note that there was a big increase in torque and horsepower for only attention to the mixture. Now this was only about a 9.2 to 1 motor and notice that it made 500 foot-pounds and 500 horsepower on 87 octane fuel and it idled like a watch. A build like this may suit a lot more of you because no expensive porting is involved. Here's the heads I ported back then. These uh, dark platinum heads were equipped with a 205-16 valve combination and uh, they flowed 300 CFM at 650 thousandths lift with a big fat flow curve all the way up to 650. A later version of these heads uh, made more horsepower than this but of course I've had best part of eight years to refine the design. As for intake manifolds, the rules for the race motor, that's the one that you can see running in uh, part one, called for a uh, two-plane manifold, a stock two-plane manifold, plus a restrictor plate, right? So that did limit our power. Now, for the uh, non-restrictive one, we used two manifolds, which gave about the same power. One was from professional products, and the other was a good old Super Victor from Edelbrock. Uh, both of those intake manifolds went way past 600 horsepower. 621 comes to mind, right? Uh, with the two-plane manifold on and the restrictor and all that, the race motor made about 545 horsepower. 
Again, this was good solid horsepower. As you can see from the video, we ran up against cars with 40 cubic inches more. Yes, sure we lost, but it was just by a smidgen. Had we had that extra 40 cubic inches, they would have lost by at least a couple of tenths. But that's all speculation. The dart heads were equipped with comps beehive spring part number 26918, an exceptionally good spring. The rockers seen with the springs were 165 on the intake and 16 on the exhaust. But we swapped these fairly early on for some crane rockers 165 and 16 because they had a faster off the seat action which is just what you need for a stroker motor. The carburetor you choose can make or break your 383 build. Firstly, let me say that Holy carburetors have come a long way since I first started using them. They were rather crude devices in 1970, but as somebody who was employed to redesign Weber carburetors, that's me, at one stage for a factory team, I can tell you that the technology that's gone into the current Holly makes it one of the finest fixed jet carburetors on the face of the planet. Just got to know how to use it. And they manufacture such a range of carburetors that it's up to you to choose the right one. Now, a couple of points here. If you are using an unheated manifold, as we were with our uh, Edelbrock um, uh, air gap, you must make sure that the fuel is atomized well, especially at part throttle. Right? Otherwise your mileage will be up the swanee, you'll uh, coke up cylinders, uh, etc. So, with an unheated manifold, a down leg booster is a minimum requirement. Do not use a straight leg one. And a down leg stepped booster, better yet. If you're going to use a spacer on your uh, two-plane manifold and it's not really the way I like to go but it, it can be beneficial in some ways remember if you put a spacer on what you're doing is you're turning your two-plane manifold into a crude single plane right then spacer you're going to need about a 770 uh, holly carburetor right or, or a quick fuel they both make um, good 750 to 770 vacuum secondaries right if you're going to bolt the carburetor straight to the manifold then you need more flow because each bank has only got two barrels to draw from so an 850 vacuum secondary is where you need to go again with a, a dog leg booster now we did try uh, one of Holly's um, throttle body injection systems on one build. Wasn't the engine that I'm talking about here, but we we used some some very mildly ported Liberty heads on a, 520, uh, a, a 383 with the Holly injection, which although it had a self-learning thing, we didn't want to spend the time letting it self-learn, so we calibrated it. You know, did some pulls, looked at the measurements, calibrated it and I can tell you it worked like a dream now it was slightly less horsepower than a carburetor but the cold start the drivability etc etc was very good with a completely civilized 383 it made 525 horsepower and 525 foot-pounds right and uh, all of that was destined for 1986 uh, Pontiac Transam As for ignition systems, there's plenty of good ones out there. And we used to change ignition systems depending on what we were going to use on the dyno, almost like uh, women change their hat style, right? So <clears throat> let me tell you, we had good results from virtually every ignition system, right? But the one I would suggest that you go for, because they do a lot of the homework for you, 
is a distributor, an HEI distributor from Performance Ignition. I've known these guys since the boss was in diapers, literally. And uh, uh, you'll also, if you're doing a street build, which our friend that I'm responding to his uh, uh, post is doing, then you will want vacuum advance. Now, fortunately, you can call the guys at Performance Distributors and they will custom build your distributor, your HEI, to your engine spec and they're very good at it. And I think that's all you need to know, especially as I'm going to be doing a, an ignition deal um, uh, shortly. So if you want to find out more about ignition systems and sparks, you'll know which channel to go to. The exhaust system is pretty simple, if you know how. Header choice is something of a dilemma here because the power level that we're looking at falls between choosing an inch and three quarter primary pipe header versus an inch and five eighths. My advice here is if you're on using this on the street, go for an inch and five eighths. If the track performance is um, critical and you know your engine's making over 570 odd horsepower, go for the inch and three quarters. Now, all of this fine tuning can be right royally screwed up by the exhaust system itself, i.e. the muffler and that. It is possible, although you'll find a lot of people say to the contrary here, to have a zero loss street legal in terms of sound exhaust system. I've told everyone how it's done. So go and check that out. This is all stuff that I've uh, dynoed personally, so there's no secondhand information there. Um, I did a lot of research work in terms of mufflers and all that, and of course, a lot of people don't know this, but I had one of the best selling mufflers on the market until it got bought out by one of the competitors who then stopped making it and I stopped receiving my royalties. That's life, I guess, but uh, anyway, episode 27. Now for some dyno curves. I've got so many to choose from that it's a bit um, awkward to put every one in. So what I'm going to do is choose a good, typical, top-end street setup, right? So we'll be looking at something around the 600 horsepower mark here. So let me sort something out and that's what you'll see in the next few frames. I want you to follow the cursor here, that little cross up in the corner. That 10.5 to one's wrong. I must not have filled that out properly. Uh, it's actually 12.5. Now you can see we used the Mali pistons in there and uh, the cam was a uh, comp cams grind on the extreme energy uh, street rollers, right? So it was not super aggressive, but was good enough to get the job done of making the power called for. Uh, the uh, profile number it is the 4874S. That's S for solid. That's my, uh, my uh, designation there. Now I want you to notice the torque per cube um, a deal and see how that goes down our peak torque was showing a uh, well there we were at 1.42 foot pounds per cube at peak torque of 5200 rpm peak power did not quite get to 621 at 620.9 Right, which was pretty good. Um, our best power per cube was uh, 1.62 horsepower per cubic inch, which for a regular motor which can be driven on the street is pretty damn good. The power curve creeping in on the right has the uh, torque and horsepower on the vertical scale and the RPM times 100 on the horizontal scale. Well, this brings us to the end of my uh, 
two videos here. Now, this has been something of an experiment, and I'd like your comments on how I might improve it, or sh whether I should give it up or not. If you did like what you see, please subscribe, like, comment, and notify. And if you want to push that little button there that transfers money into our account, that would be fine as well. Um, the, a reason for that has become more prominent now is that unfortunately my partner died a few weeks ago and that this has put a very great load on me to produce these videos and the only way I can keep it up is to uh, more or less take it up full time so it's got to pay for itself otherwise I'm gonna have to do something else but anyway that's entirely up to you thank you for watching